We are thinking, learning animals. Our brains are constantly busy collecting and filtering information. Some information will make it into our long-term storage, our memory, but others are mere noise. If marketers can uncover what is going on in our brains that makes us choose one brand over another, how we filter information and what sticks, then they would have identified the secret to success. This is what Martin Lindstrom calls biology, the subconscious thoughts, feelings, and desires that drive our purchasing decisions we make each and every day. And he believes the future of marketing is to truly and completely understand the thoughts, feelings, motivations, needs, and desires of consumers. Join us for the next 10 minutes to explore further. I am irrational and emotional. I'm human. As human beings, we think of ourselves as a rational species. We like to think we are more Spock-like. Unfortunately, all of us engage in behavior for which we have no logical or clear-cut explanation. The more stress we're under, the more uncertain we feel, the more irrationally we tend to behave. Our true reactions and emotions are more likely to be found in the nanosecond lapse before thinking is translated into words. Listrom points out that if marketers want the truth, unplugged and uncensored, about what causes us to buy, they have to get inside our brains. Because emotions are the way in which our brains encode things of value, a brand that engages us emotionally will win every single time. Marketing to the brain, or neuromarketing, isn't about implanting ideas in our brains or forcing us to buy what we don't want to buy. It's about uncovering what's already inside our heads, the emotional and irrational associations we make with products. Take American Idol. The three judges all keep cups of coke in front of them, and both the judges and the contestants sit on chairs or couches with rounded contours specifically designed to look like a bottle of Coca-Cola. Whether through semi-subtle imagery or traditional advertising spots, Coca-Cola is visually present approximately for 60% of the time on the show. Now think of the Ford Motor Company, also a major sponsor. They invested $26 million in yearly sponsorship and actually lost market share. Why? Coke was integrated fully into the narrative, while Ford wasn't at all. According to Lidstrom, Ford doesn't play a role in the show. He reveals that we have no memory of brands that don't play an integral part of the storyline of a program. They become white noise and are easily, instantaneously, forgotten. Your product has to make sense within the show's emotional narrative. Want it to be high-flying and adored? Coke can help. Want to have the world swooning at your feet? Drink a Coke. By merely sipping the drink on stage, the three judges forged a powerful association between the drink and the emotions provoked by the show. I'm successful and drink Coke. So can you. Immersive Experience Ever sit and watch an American football game and feel yourself reacting to the tackles or take a sharp intake of breath before a hit? Why does this happen? Why do we mimic how others interact with objects? According to Lindstrom, we can put it down to mirror neurons. When we watch someone do something, whether it's scoring a penalty kick or playing a perfect melody on a grand piano, our brains react as if we were actually performing these activities ourselves. In short, it's as though seeing and doing are one and the same. Mirror neurons are responsible for why we unwittingly imitate other people's behavior. Interestingly, mirror neurons are also at work when the opposite takes place, on those occasions when we actually take pleasure in others' bad luck. Lindstrom suggests mirror neurons not only help us imitate other people, they're responsible for human empathy. They send signals to the emotional region of our brains so we can experience what it's like to walk in another person's shoes. But mirror neurons don't work alone. Often they work in tandem with dopamine, one of the brain's pleasure chemicals. Dopamine is one of the most addictive substances known to science, and purchasing decisions are driven in some part by its seductive effects. Here's how Lidstrom suggests the combination works. As you pass by a store with desirable goods on display, your mirror neurons fire up. You can imagine yourself being a proud owner of the goods, popular, desired, at the center of it all. You approach the counter with what you've just picked out. As you're getting ready to blow your bank account, 
your dopamine level soars into the heavens. As the clerk rings up and bags your purchases in that beautifully branded bag, you're feeling cool and one of the in crowd. Dopamine subtly flushes your brain with pleasure, and before you know it, you've signed the credit card receipt. A few minutes later, as you exit the store, bag in hand, the euphoric feeling caused by the dopamine recede, and all of a sudden you wonder whether you'll actually ever use that camera or wear those shoes. Sound familiar? As he states, between your mirror neurons making you feel sexy and attractive, and your dopamine creating that near-orgasmic anticipation of reward, your rational mind doesn't stand a chance. As marketers begin to learn more about how mirror neurons drive our behavior, they'll find more and more ways to play upon them to get us to buy. Buyers, beware. It's a kind of magic. Listrom suggests the more unpredictable the world becomes, the more we grope for a sense of control over our lives. And the more anxiety and uncertainty we feel, the more we adopt superstitious behavior and rituals to help shepherd us through. So what do rituals have to do with what we think about when we buy? A lot. For one thing, products and brands that have rituals or superstitions associated with them are much stickier than those that don't. Once we find a ritual or a brand we like, isn't there a lot of comfort in having that particular blend of coffee to brew every morning? A signature shampoo with a familiar smell? Or a favorite make of running sneaker we buy year after year? Lidstrom suggests brand obsession has a lot in common with rituals and superstitious behavior. Both involve habitual, repeated actions that have little or no logical basis, and both stem from the need for a sense of control in an overwhelming and complex world. When we are stressed out, or when life feels random and out of control, we often seek out comfort in familiar products and objects. We want to have solid, consistent patterns in our lives and in our brands. We need shortcuts. Why did I choose you? These are subconscious conversations going on in our heads every time we choose one product over another. If asked to describe how you came to your decision, you'd probably shrug and reply, instinct, or no reason, or I just did. But the real rationale behind your choices was in fact built on a lifetime of associations, some positive, others negative, that you weren't consciously aware of. Listrom gives us a name for these brain shortcuts, a somatic marker. Sown by past experiences of reward and punishment, these markers serve to connect an experience or emotion with a specific required reaction. These same cognitive shortcuts are what underlie most of our buying decisions. Every day, we manufacture new ones, adding them to our decision portfolio. Whether for necessities or for pleasures, somatic markers help us with every buying decision we're able to make. So how do these markers form? And do companies and advertisers work to deliberately create these in our brains? Lidstrom suggests it's easy and inexpensive to create a somatic marker in consumers' brains. It's all about the unexpected. Sony created an ingenious somatic marker in the weeks before the release of Spider-Man 3, using men's rooms in selected theaters. A guy would stroll in and see a conventional line of urinals and stalls, nothing out of the ordinary. That is, until he would happen to gaze upward and see a single, standalone plastic urinal seven feet above his head. Next to it, the words Spider-Man 3, coming soon. Others create somatic markers in consumers' minds using humor. Fear, too, can create some of the most powerful somatic markers, and many advertisers are all too happy to take advantage of our stressed out, insecure, increasingly vulnerable natures. Selling to our senses. According to Lidstrom, visual images are far more effective and more memorable when they are coupled with another sense, like touch, sound, or smell. When we see and smell something we like at the same time, like Johnson's & Johnson's baby powder combined with its signature vanilla-y scent, various regions of our brain light up together. When a pleasant fragrance matches up with an equally appealing and congruous visual image, we not only perceive it as more pleasant, we're also more likely to remember it. But if the two are incongruous, forget about it. Literally. 
of all our senses, smell is the most primal, the most deeply rooted. Touch is another sensory sales technique. We like to stroke, rub, caress, and run our fingers through the garments we're considering before we commit to buying them. Kind of like a sensory test run. Why else do you think those tables of clothing at the Gap in Banana Republic are positioned where they are? To be looked at? Of course not. They're there, awaiting your fingers. As for sound? The sound of a can of Pringles potato chips opening is largely engineered to make you associate the product with lips smacking freshness. According to Lindstrom, tomorrow's retail world will have the distinct smell of cantaloupe, lemongrass, tangerine. It won't be black and white, but in vivid color. It will chirp, waltz, holler, infuse you, and leave you humming. And this assault on your senses will be more effective in winning your mind, your loyalty, and your dollars than you ever thought possible. And there you have it, a primer on biology so that you can start applying it to your business. Hi, I'm Rhonda, and this is an exclusive audiobook video recorded for the Audiobook Master Channel. Enjoy your audiobook and have fun learning. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification button so you'll get updated on our next upload. If you liked the video, give us a thumbs up and say your thoughts about the book we just covered. Do you want to listen to a summary or review of a book that we haven't covered in the past? Say it in the comments below or send us a message. Don't forget to check our other uploads. Enjoy listening!